in that sort of lovely white middle class area of, of, of Great Britain where they're nominal Christians and if you ask them they'll say the Church of England and many of them go to church without knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. My heart breaks for them. Yeah. And they think they're on their way to heaven, you know, filling the pews and, and, and doing their duty, but they don't know Jesus Christ as their first Lord and Savior, and neither will they leave, despite some of the things that we've heard and spoken about already at this conference. I think it would <coughs> carry so much more weight to somebody who had come from the Church of England would come and speak in that place. So an invitation to you, uh, for sure. So I had been in a, a dead church, it wasn't the Church of England, when I was uh, miraculously born again. I wish I had a, a wonderful, powerful testimony uh, to share with you. Uh, uh, my companion, who's in our, our church fellowship and travelled with me, we were talking about personal testimonies on the way up. And is it wonderful that the further down you go, you know, the more powerful your testimony becomes? But you have to realise and understand that according to God, we were all once dead in our sin and transgression, amen? So it doesn't really matter where you were or where you came from or the depths that you plummeted in the eyes of God. We were all sinners and we all needed a saviour. We all needed the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? amen. And therefore, uh, my uh, salvation experience, my born-again experience, my new birth and yours is as much of a miracle as anybody else's, amen? And don't let anybody tell you any differently. So I was radically uh, born again. Uh, uh, again, perhaps it will take too much time because we're behind time to share my testimony. But uh, I do recall, without sharing with you the events leading up to my um, spiritual rebirth, that I've been lent a book. My sister, um, who was in also in the same church, just given birth, and by the miracle of childbirth, had come to this spiritual awakening, and, uh, and herself had become born again. She was one of the few people at that time. I was a, a punk rocker. I was, uh, you know, rebellious. I was into all the loud music and, and misbehavior and all those kind of things. And she was one of the few people who could speak into my life. And she called me up. And she said, Ian, you have to come and speak with me. And I went to visit her, and I sat on the other end of the settee, and through floods of tears, she told me that she received the most wonderful news. And uh, she told me, without any fear or trepidation, she, she told me that it was the most wonderful news. And without swearing, which I did at the time, I said, well, if it's that living good, why are you crying? And she said, well, I know that I'm going to heaven. She said, it's the most wonderful news. And I said, well, if it's that good, why are you crying? She said, because you won't be there with me. And of course, sometimes it takes someone just to tell you the truth. She wasn't theologically trained. She wasn't gifted as an evangelist. She just loved me. And that love compelled her to share the good news with me. So... You know, I remember that it didn't happen there and then. I remember being home one day, uh, sick, on uh, a sick day from work, and, and being in my own bedroom, curtains closed. I was unwell, and I read this book. And again, I won't, it's not necessary that you know the book or the, the prayer that was made, but such was my understanding, my limited understanding, even though I was in church, that, the, that there was a prayer which uh, the invitation was to make this prayer that I climbed out of bed and knelt, just as I have done as a child with my parents to say prayers, you know, before we went to bed each night, I knelt on the floor beside the bed and I said this prayer. And so powerful was it that I knew that there had been some kind of shift, that something remarkable had happened, but with no discipleship or training, I didn't realize that it was happening uh, inside of me. I thought it was happening outside. I drew back the curtains. I thought that there would be thunderbolts and, you know, the thing was breaking down. And, you know, it was incredible. Something had changed and shifted in my life there and then. And at that point, at that point, I knew I had to leave the church that I was in. The teaching was weak and poor, believe it or not. I mean, not in the Sunday school, but uh, uh, the minister in that church, uh, in the main service, would teach with finger puppets and so on. It was, it was, uh, it was pediatric stuff, and I was hungry to learn more about God. I was, I was reading more Bible on my own without any discipleship than, than I was receiving in church. And I was beginning to discover that there, that there was this third person that was never talked about in our church, the Holy Spirit, uh, whom I was desperate uh, to meet with. And, and I understood that, that, that uh, there were things happening in my life. You know, the first thing, that the signs of my new experience was a demonstration of fruits of the Spirit in my life. I, I, I wanted the gifts of the Spirit in my life. And so I actually took myself off to find, without knowing what it was, a Pentecostal church. Now... New people born again are not disciples, so I haven't got a clue, by the way. And in, in some respects, it's useful that I share with you these things, because some of which I say 
you know, we're going to look at in hindsight, we're going to look back at some of the events which I, I, I remember or, or now look back on and think is leading to the beginning and the end for, for the Pentecostal churches that I was involved in. And it's going to seem like ancient history, but there, there will be a point to it. But of course, at the time, you have to remember, I was newly born again. And so I had, I had no theological training, I had, had no discipleship. So a lot of us, I presume us, several of us maybe, have been swept along, carried away with things, you know, trusted those who should have been discipling us to lead us in a better way, and have been caught up in things that perhaps now in hindsight we might regret. But let me tell you, nothing is ever wasted with God. Amen. 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 28, he is the God who works all things together to good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. And God will take all those things. You know, I've, I've heard it all. He'll, he'll, he'll take your a misery and turn it into your ministry. He'll take your mess and turn it into a message. And so it's proven for me. God is good. Amen. God is good. And I love him very much. And I love serving him. Have I known just how good he was and how well he looked after me. I, I would have left uh, my secular employment. I was employed at that time and served him. I knew uh, for a long time, even before I was born again, that I was to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Anyway, so uh, to make a short story even longer. <laughs> why use one word when thousands of you do? So to make a short story even, even longer, I had decided at that point the word crossroads has been used. I had reached the crossroads. That was the first time in my new Christian life or experience that I had reached the crossroads. And I knew that I couldn't stay, even at that time, before the sort of things that we're talking about, that I couldn't stay in that particular church. I found my way to uh, the Assemblies of God at that time. Well, I say Assemblies of God, I've written in my note AOG, and I've put, which is the Assemblies of God, not, as, not the almost of God, as some people like to call it. <laughs> The Assemblies of God. And actually, to be fair, back then in 1987, although I was new to the faith of that maturity, it, it appeared to me very much at that time to be sound. Spiritual gifts were regularly displayed in that church. Rarely a meeting went by without the tongue being given. Almost always followed by an interpretation and always done in good order and always with the pastor's approval. But there was nothing weird or wacky going on. As a new convert, uh, you know, I wasn't sure what I would find. It didn't disturb me, it edified me, it helped me, it built me up. Some of the churches you go in today, now you'd open the door and you'd turn and run a mile, wouldn't you? But back then, it, the, those spiritual gifts. I found myself saying to somebody last night when we, uh, with a meal, we were talking about such things. It, it's a narrow path that we're called to walk. Yeah. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. I, I don't think that the devil really cares which side you, uh, of the narrow path you fall off. You know, whether it's dead religion or whether it's charismania, I don't think he cares as long as you just fall off. Yeah. Uh, and, and you see, the thing is now, with many of the churches that sometimes I'm invited to speak in and, and so-called Pentecostal churches, you know, they'll warn you, they'll ask you before you take the pulpit, we, we hope that there'll be no evidence of the gift of the Spirit because it will frighten people off or it, we, we've got visitors. They, but, you know, for me, it was a wonderful experience. I wanted to know more about the Holy Spirit. And I have to say, back then, uh, in the mid, towards the end of the 80s, it was all done, or at least it seemed to be, unless I was just in a good church, done in very good order. Everything was done in good order. So none of this put me off whatsoever, in fact quite the opposite. The content of the tongue, as given by the interpretation, was generally edifying and would build us up. Most often it was in harmony with God's written word, against which it could be tested. In fact, the most curious thing to me, and this is supposed to be a joke, it was really curious to me at the time as a young man, the extent to which I was disturbed was not by seeing the gift of the Spirit, the extent to which I was disturbed was why for the old boys in the Pentecostal church at that time, God always seemed to speak in the language of the old King James. <laughs> I didn't really quite fathom, you know, I thought when I got to heaven, that's how God would be speaking, thus saith the Lord. That will... Anyway, I was in my early twenties, so it appeared to me that the pastor at that time was, was an older gentleman. Certainly he had white hair, he was humble and he was modest. Unlike many today, he was quite approachable, and I mean this in a good way, he was a very ordinary chap. He'd been married to the same woman for many years. 
I know, there's a bit of a revelation in this yes. thing. He'd been married, to the, the pastor had, was the husband of one wife. He'd been married to her for many years. He had several children. He had many grandchildren. And guess what? They were all in church and they all loved the Lord. Amen. In fact, most of them served, and many of them played musical instruments in a time of worship. You see, all these are scriptural things, scriptural things, largely overlooked these days in church in favour of some kind of greater anointing. <laughs> anyway, he was a good guy, and his family all seemed to love the Lord, and they all served. <laughs> also, there seemed to be sort of more men in the church in those days, as is the case now, particularly older men who seemed very quick off the mark to want to offer me some godly instruction, which, as we just heard, was good. By the way, that's what we needed. I mean, I'd come from a church where there was no discipleship whatsoever. So to find these old Pentecostal boys were full of nuggets of truth, I remember many of them. Particularly, I remember you know, being told that I should always keep short accounts, and listen to this, live every day as if it might be the day of the Lord's return. That's how I was taught, you know, just keep short accounts. Stay close to Jesus, keep short accounts, live every day as if it might be the return of the Lord. They don't even talk about the return of the Lord in church anymore. I mean, that's true. I mean, that's, uh, as an aside, I get invited to speak in many places. I mean, I used to, having come out of the church that I came out of, you know, I, I found ministry, when I first came into ministry, incredibly hard. And I was thrilled to hear some of the, the, the wisdom that came from our previous speaker and, uh, and, and about how God had spoken to him about what his ministry would be. I waited for a long time for God to tell me what my ministry would be. I used to, if I can use the word, it's probably inappropriate, but having come from where I, I have been, where pastors have become motivational uh, speakers and, and pulpit celebrities, you know, I struggled to write sexy sermons, you know, that would uh, thrill everybody and itch their ears. And it was a, it was a dickens of a job. To, to keep coming up with sermons that would be popular with people. And the Lord made it very easy for me. He just told me, you know, this. he said, when you meet with the world, tell them about Jesus. When you meet with the church, tell them to get ready, he's coming again. I mean, and that's, that's basically it, that's, that's it now. And, and yet, it seems so more vital than some of the other things that I used to try and do. Anyway, as I say, these old boys had their advice for me. Keep short accounts of every day, as if it might be the day of the Lord's return. I was a happy Pentecostal. And I was growing in the Lord. Happy days. I haven't said that I was a happy Pentecostal. Sadly, all that would later change. As an aside, by the way, I remember the first time I went to hear a certain Jacob Brash teach. This was in a village hall somewhere in rural Somerset, not far from Martok Chris. And I remember reading this little biopic, you know, those little form of words to introduce people that, that goes along by that picture. And alongside the picture of Jacob as, as today's speaker, it began something like this. Jacob describes himself as a conservative Pentecostal. Well, in a moment when we come to why I left, I have to say that for several years now, I've described myself as an ashamed Pentecostal. You see, at some point, things began to change. On a local level for me, the older gentleman who passed at the church retired and a new man came in. And I know that few people like change, myself included, but before long, and for this by the way, I take full and personal responsibility, I became backslidden and I started going to church less and less frequently. Perhaps, as it turns out, just as well, because subsequently the new pastor fell into sexual impropriety, by the time I came to my senses and returned to church, it was not to the AOG, but it was to Elin. <coughs> and, by the way, what an exciting time this promised to be. A time of revival, they said. After all, Pentecostalism in the UK had since discovered the Kansas City prophets. They hadn't Bob Jones predicted already, so he said the Toronto blessing. And so with the arrival of the 90s, to use the vernacular, Pentecostalism was off the chain. It was certainly off the rails. <laughs> and this once strongly biblical and evangelical Pentecostal denomination was about to head onto the broader road and off of the narrow path. 
for me finding my way back into church, largely oblivious to the things which had been taking place. I've been backslidden and out of church circles. My new pastor in Exeter was a graduate of Ray McCauley's Rayma Bible College, South Africa. <laughs> Therefore, not only was he uh, a uh, proponent of Kenneth Hagin's Word of Faith teachings, plagiarized from E.W. Kenyon, but he was also a stablemate of Rodney Howard Brand. <laughs> he who made a name for himself as God's so called bartender. And of course, this was soon to be the time of Toronto. Now, brothers and sisters, I, I would like to tell you that such things as prosperity, a word of faith, movements, being drunk in the spirit, laughing uncontrollably at all of the way out and wacky manifestations of the so-called blessing, I'd love to be able to tell you that they were confined to this one who lived church in Exeter. But of course they weren't. That which I was experiencing was happening all over, and as you well know, was endemic throughout Ealing. And, by the way, much of Pentecostalism in the Western world. By the way, the reason this particular pastor in Exeter, who, by the way, at that time did not have an Elam credential, was given the Elam Church in Exeter, was the cause <coughs> of his association with Rodney Howard Brown. This was at a time when the then General Superintendent, Wynne Lewis, was supporting and promoting the likes of Howard Brown meetings in Preston. Randy Clark meetings in Solihull. Morris Cirillo was uh, receiving the full support of the Elite National Leadership Team. And it was Wynne Lewis who once claimed to be responsible for introducing Paul Kane to Arthur <coughs> Kendall, seeking some credit, one would imagine, for what he said was bringing the Spirit and the Word together. It was wonderful to hear a different interpretation of the Spirit and the Word coming together this morning certainly wasn't the case that bringing Paul Kane and R.T. Kendall was bringing the Spirit and the Word together. It was during the tenure of Gwyn Lewis also that he altered its statement of faith, changing its position with the removal of its premillennial stamp, stance and thus opening further the way to a raft of alternative interpretations and strange ideas. I had a very interesting conversation over breakfast this morning. Some of the ideas that have, have, have crept in, just ridiculous. That shift in the statement of faith, by the way, was uh, soon followed by the AOG. Anyway, still blissfully unaware of much of the controversy going on in the church world, <coughs> trusting innocently, or foolishly perhaps, in church leadership, and can I just say, underlying all this so you don't think bad of me, because everyone likes to be liked, don't they? <laughs> My, my, my core reason or purpose, you know, at that time for being there, where I was at my particular walk, was desperate to see revival. I mean, that was no bad thing, just desperate to see revival. It was soon after that Wynne Lewis invited me into ministry with Elin and appointed me as the assistant pastor in the Exeter Elin Church, by then, get this, known as the River Dream Center. <laughs> And so, to my great shame, it fell on me to organise the meetings of Rodney Howard Brown in that church in my hometown. Yes, I had to organise Howard Brown meetings, and I did. Having been a businessman and a reasonably, business, uh, reasonably successful businessman, I knew how to arrange a meeting, and we packed the place. The place was full. Buses came from all over to hear the man speak. Bless God, it was on such a night in a full church by the way, no, when, when no word had been preached, yet with people rolling in the arms, crawling on all fours, laughing hysterically and uncontrollably, that God opened my eyes. And although I didn't need him at that time, I escaped the local church by becoming increasingly involved in teaching and preaching in Africa, and in some small way trying to forewarn them about that which was allowed to come their way. Guess what it did? This is completely an aside now that churches where, where I once went and saw true moves of the Holy Spirit, now I go and find them lined up, two lines with envelopes of money, and a lot of people at the side look very disappointed. If you ask why, it's, uh, the, the level of blessing they're going to receive it, it is uh, equatable to the amount of money in their envelope. There are places in Kampala in Uganda where I used to preach, and the capital of Kampala I could hardly find anywhere to preach anymore because they know that I speak 
against prosperity. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? Like, uh, I don't know if any of you are ex-smokers, but they say there's no bigger anti-smoker than an ex-smoker. You know, there's no one uh, more opposed to that prosper, so-called prosperity gospel. Can we stop calling it the prosperity gospel, by the way? The scripture says that there is only one gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if anyone comes teaching any other gospel, even if he be an angel, let it be a curse. There is no other gospel. There is only the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So we have to stop calling these things prosperity gospel, prosperity nonsense. I can smell it a mile off. I had all the teaching, you know, seed time and harvest, seed time and harvest. You know, if you want a harvest of money, you're going to have to plant a seed of money. Wait some time and receive your harvest. And if you will give seed for the sowing and bread for the eating. Listen, if you have a need, brothers and sisters, and that which you have in your wallet and your purse is not enough to meet the need, it can't be the bread, it must be the seed. Sow it into my ministry. Wait some time and God will meet your every need. We have students in our church who knew that their grants wouldn't go from, from uh, one term to another, so they were encouraged to put all their grant money in the offering. And they did. And the church took it. Shocking. I despise that gospel. Gospel, I said it myself, we shouldn't call it. There's no good news attached to it whatsoever. So I was blissfully unaware. But bless God, it was on one such night where Howard Brown was teaching that my eyes were open. It was like, you, know, you won't find it in your Bibles, by the way. It's Hans Christian Andersen, I think, you know, the, the, the story of the fairy tale of the Emperor's New Clothes. You know, that, was, that was the moment for me. You know, in a packed church, we closed the doors. There was many people queuing up the street to get in as they were inside, making fools of themselves. And suddenly I saw it for what it was. Uh, and afterwards, I've been packing up and going home in the car with my wife. I just said, if I the only one who saw this evening that God wasn't in that place. And thankfully, my wife said, praise the Lord. I thought I was the only one who thought that. We both saw at the same time. I should have left there and then, by the way. I should have left there and then, by the way, because it did me no good to stay. Uh, and so hearing people say, and, and you know, there's going to be an awful lot of repetition, I think, through this conference, because I believe it's not what Jacob is saying, or Chris is saying, or Jonathan and myself are saying, it's what the Spirit of God is saying. It, it is time to leave and come out. I made a mistake, by the way, in staying. And so what happened in staying, I developed a critical spirit. Yeah. You know, I, I was not behaving like a good Christian. I would come home from church. Did you hear what he said? Did you see what he did? I'd be the head of my house before long. My wife was saying, did you see what the pastor's wife did today? Did you see? And we were developing critical spirits. I should have got out there and then. Anyway, that's an aside. Now, I want to understand to you that all of this is ancient history, so let me try and make it relevant to today. And let me use the short epistle of Jude to try and make some points. Yeah. The book of Jude is sometimes referred to as the vestibule or the waiting room of Revelation. And it's incredibly meaningful for us today. It was S. Maxwell Coder, a former vice president and dean of education at the Moody Bible Institute, who said this, and I quote, The beginning of the church age is recorded for us in the book of Acts, and the end of the church age is set forth in the little epistle of Jude. Dr. Coder also said that since the book of Acts is called the Acts of the Apostles, Jude should be called the Acts of the Apostates. <laughs> Turn with me your Bibles, please, to Jude. I don't know how far we'll get because I think time is against me. Uh, so let's see what the Lord will show us. Let's start from the beginning and see how far he'll permit us to go. Jude, a bond servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ. He's writing, by the way, to you and me. Amen? Amen. To those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. What a lovely prayer. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. So I'm going to stop there. As early as the fourth verse, which we're going to come to, Jude 
having been arrested by the Holy Spirit. You see, he was arrested by the Spirit for writing the letter he had purposed to, and he was compelled by the Holy Spirit to warn his readers against apostasy. And that's what he does in verse 4. He informs us that certain men had crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and denied the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's read on. But I want to remind you, he's reminding us today, I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterwards, destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain. Each one of these, by the way, just let me break in. You know, it's a tiny epistle, I think, 417 words are going from memory in the original language. So that the fifth shortest book of the Bible, it's tiny. But you really must study it, brothers and sisters. If you haven't already, you really need to go deep in this. Because everything that Jude talks about in itself is a sermon, it is a study. There's so much content in here. But the thing Jude does is he makes this assumption that you and I as readers, and certainly the people that he was writing to, would have known all these things. So he's, he's not telling us, uh, he's not teaching us, he's saying, I'm reminding you. You see, we can't be ignorant. You need to understand the Word of God. You need to read and understand your Bible to take this advice. I want to remind you that though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. I might talk about those in a moment, but that speaks to me. Look, you know, I, I know I want to be careful, and we're not going to over-spiritualize things, but I think we can see being delivered out of Egypt, out of bondage, as, as a picture of, of our own, in some respect, spiritual life, and now that we're in the wilderness, waiting, you know, to uh, come into the promised land. It just says to me, that it's possible for good to be delivered out of Egypt, out of bondage, and yet not make it to the other side, to be destroyed in the wilderness for unbelief. He's warning us. And you know, here's the thing, I just want to be absolutely certain that we understand, because it took a long time for the penny to drop with me. I don't think he's warning us as much against apostates. I think he's warning us against becoming apostates. So don't read this as that he's talking about everybody else. He's talking to you and he's talking to me. It's a warning to us. They came out of Egypt, but they were afterwards destroyed because they didn't believe. The angels who did not keep their proper domain but left their own abode. Well, we won't go there, but that's an interesting teaching, whether you take the Sethite or angelic view and the Nephilim and all those things. Incredibly interesting uh, teaching, but not for today. He, what, what about them? He's reserved in everlasting chains and the darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth. What are they set forth as? As an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. They're an example to us. Several times you'll find in the scriptures, in the New Testament, Solomon and Gomorrah set forth as an example for us. It's given as an example for you and me. Remember what the Lord said about, you know, as it was in the days of Noah. And, and so, you know, likewise as it should be in the days of... But the, the, we, we're living in these times, by the way. We're living in these times. Signs of where we are at the end time clock. These things that are going on all around us. So these... These are three examples of Old Testament apostasy that Jude gives us. And having read a little of them about being, uh, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire, it's the most dire of warnings against apostasy. Severe warning. I'm going to break it down to you into to Ian language. Here's a warning. Bad behavior will always follow after bad doctrine. Yes. Yeah. I didn't go to theological college to learn that. But I tell you it's the truth. Bad behavior will always follow after bad doctrine. And that will eventually lead to apostasy. 
Bad behavior will always follow after bad doctrine. Or as H.A. Ironside said, unholy ways always accompany and indeed spring from unholy teachings. He continues, hence we can easily understand the readiness with which apostates from the truth give themselves up to what is defining, a defining a big problem and abominable. Here we go, back into Ian's words, I'm not that eloquent. The proof of the pudding, brethren, in regard to whether, uh, whether any of those men of whom I spoke earlier were truly men of God or apostates has been proved by time. They are those who speak evil of whatever they do not know, of whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts. In these things they have corrupted themselves. Woe to them, it says in Jude, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam the prophet, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Another three examples. Oh, Jude is the preacher's friend. We all love a three-point sermon. And he likes to lay it out for us in, in three points. Here come another three examples of notorious apostates. Cain, Balaam, and Korah. We do well to understand a little about each of them in order to avoid going the same way. <coughs> Now, I don't know about your churches and fellowships and where you came from, but that's not what they were teaching in my church. We were happy, clappy, rah, rah, rah. You know, most of the service was either taken up with the teenage rock band that began the service or the three quarter of an hour offering. Yeah. <laughs> but they didn't teach us how to avoid the way of Cain, Balaam, and Korah. Study them, brothers and sisters. I wish I had time, and I don't. But study them for yourselves. Let me give you some clues. The way of Cain is false religion. The way of Cain is false religion. I think it was mentioned earlier in Hebrews 11, the great uh, uh, chapter of faith. By the faith, Abel brought the better offering. And then it wasn't that Cain didn't believe. Cain came before God. He believed all right, but he came before him on his own terms. By faith, Abel bought the better offering. Oh my goodness, and it's not in my notes, but I just feel compelled to tell you this as well. And I don't normally, particularly having said where I've come from and the gifts of the Spirit and so on, I never claim to be a prophet, and I rarely, uh, from, from a platform, prophesy, but this is as plain as the nose on your face, that if Cain is false religion and represents religion, and Abel had faith and represented the true church, it's the religious who will try and kill the faithful. When the persecution comes, it will be Cain who is trying to kill Abel, trying to shut up Abel, trying to keep Abel down. I think it was mentioned last night, but persecution will come from Cain. It was Cain who killed Abel. So the way of Cain is false religion. The error of Balaam, what an interesting character he is. He really should have a study of Balaam. The error of Balaam is false ministry. And again, he's saying, of course, it's false worship and rebellion against Christ's authority. Balaam, by the way, you know, he did hear from God, but he isn't described as a prophet. He's described as a soothsayer and a divinator. God hates divination. I'm not going to even go there to great sucking and Bill Johnson and Bethel and. Jude goes on. These are spots in your love feasts while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. Oh my goodness me. It took me ages coming into ministry. I understand I'm here to feed the sheep, not fleece the sheep. They feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead, pulled up by the roots. Raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. Wandering stars, listen brothers and sisters, for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Don't go the way of the apostate. We've been talking about coming to the crossroads. Don't, don't go back to Egypt. Don't go, don't follow these guys. Because unholy ways accompany unholy teachings. For example, do you ever wonder why so many big shot Evangelical and charismatic preachers who are always talking about money and materialism. Ever wonder why so many of them do fall into sexual impropriety? 
I tell you, the reason why so many of the charismatics who love to be celebrities in the church, they flaunt their wealth, and cheap gentlemen, they flaunt their wealth. Listen, I just broke into my house in the church I came from. We're talking about why I left. It was a new chapel. They gutted the place. They, they blanked in the windows. They turned it into like a nightclub. They put the biggest screen. It had a bigger screen at one point in the church, bigger than it did in, in the local cinema multiplex. And at the time of offering, which would probably take an offering teaching, a prosperity teaching, and went to the offering that would last about three quarters of an hour, on the screen would be projected images of holiday condos uh, and gold-plated Rolls Royces, Porsches, Lamborghinis. It wasn't even subliminal. It was just put right up there to encourage you to put your money in the box. And the reason so many charismatics who flaunt their wealth and teach others how to come by it fall into sexual impropriety is because they're teaching lust. The word of faith, name it, claim it, teachings use a method of envisioning. Just like that big screen I mentioned. Your heart becomes a breeding ground of all your carnal imaginings, of all the things that you want, of having and only better things and obtaining greater materialism. One then becomes dissatisfied with one's lot. Then one stops giving thanks for that which we have. We begin to complain and grumble. And guess what? We become just like Israel in the wilderness, grumbling and complaining, dissatisfied with bread from heaven. Let's go back to Egypt, we say. Apostasy, brethren. That's apostasy in our lives. When God is leading you out, don't go back. People perish in the wilderness. The money teachers who shift focus off of Jesus and on to materialism make people lusty, teaching their disciples to seek the things of the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away, and the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Hallelujah. The Pentecostal church became full of materialism. It became full of frothy, motivational teaching. It wasn't like when I first went there of the old timers calling us to repentance. I learned every seven steps there were to this and every five keys there were to that. I got taught how to train the flesh and make me the best me I can be. Even though the Bible tells me that I'm to crucify the flesh so there's no longer I who live, but Christ is me. So what rubbish and nonsense they teach. So bad behavior always follows after bad doctrine. Hang around with a name it, claim it, brigade like I did for any length of time, as I once did. See how quickly you become dissatisfied with your lot. Start asking God, for more and more things of the world rather than thanking him for what you have from above. Jude writes of those delivered from Egypt who were destroyed in the wilderness for their unbelief. <coughs> were they content with all that they had done for them? No, they were not. Their dissatisfaction led them into apostasy, worshipping the golden calf, fornicating with the Midianites, the result of the doctrine of Balaam. That's what he did. Bad behavior follows after bad doctrine. Find a liberal church that denies the literal account of creation provided by Genesis, and I'll show you a church that pretty soon will perform a same-sex marriage. Yes. Genesis sets out God's plan for marriage between one man and one woman. But hey, if you teach that Genesis is just a fable anyway, then what does it matter? Pretty soon, you're going to have a same-sex marriage. It's only a fable anyway. Bad behavior always follows after bad doctrine. Forbid a man, even a priest, from marrying him. 
force him to live a life of celibacy, and then stand back and witness his tremendous failure in, this, in, in the area of sexual morality. Before long, you'll have a sex scandal on your hands. Decades of hidden child abuse in your churches. Why? Because bad behaviour always follows after bad doctrine. And so, although referring back to the Kansas City prophets, Paul Cain, Rodney Howard Brown, Randy Park, and Toronto, may one seem like yesterday's news, brothers and sisters, it serves to point out that certain men crept into Pentecostal circles those years back. And bad behaviour always follows after bad doctrine. Unholy ways always follow after unholy teachings. So any wonder that the Eden church I once belonged to is now an unholy church. The last straw for me, by the way, and then I'll move on to something else that what's happening now and where I am. The last straw for me, which caused me to have a, a huge fallout with the then general superintendent, by this time John Glass, was when the disgraced Robert Leary, a man caught in an illicit homosexual affair in the States, was installed as a leader of the Kensington Temple Bible College, okay. KT. Not that I was necessarily opposed to him being restored at some time repentant to fellowship, but I dared to question the wisdom of installing him as head of KT's Bible College. And for daring to ask if it was considered wise to do such a thing, I was duly chastised. I met a lady earlier, I hope she won't mind me saying we discussed a few things about our experiences. I met a couple also, I believe, over coffee. Spiritual abuse, you know, when you're not able to ask genuine, godly questions based on scripture, when you're told that, that you just need to shut up and exercise godly submission to those who are over you, when, when you are shouted down and humiliated and embarrassed for exercising godly wisdom and offering godly counsel, that's control, yeah. brothers and sisters, that's abuse. Yeah, my mistake was, was to ask a simple question. I remember the day it was in a conference such as this and I was told you could ask any question. I, I thought I, I couched my question carefully. It wasn't critical, it wasn't accusing. I think it was the Holy Spirit that, 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 that convicted uh, that day. I simply stood up and, and asked a genuine question with a question mark after it. Should I be concerned that Robert Lynn has been appointed as a leader in the KT Bible College? Man, you should have heard what got fired back at me. Well, I wasn't unduly surprised, however, therefore, when I came across this article, just last year, he reads this. Robert Lynn, in a message to Kensington Temple, KT, and even Pentecostal Church of London, demonstrates in one single sermon everything that's wrong with contemporary charismatic and Pentecostal church. Speaking as a leader of KT's Bible College, Lynn tells Christians to leave dead, dumb churches. What's his definition of dead and dumb church, according to Lynn? If a church is not a prosperity preaching, Pentecostal, word of faith church, then Christians should leave. <laughs> Listen to this. He continues, ignorance is not bliss. There is no blessing in being ignorant. That's why you should not go to a dead, dumb church. If you go into a dead, dumb church, I have a prophecy for you. Leave that dead, dumb church. You say, Brother Roberts, how do you leave a dead, dumb church? Watch me, in brackets, he walks off stage. And where should I go? Probably the church that everyone is scared of is where you should go. That's probably where Jesus goes. That's the church that's usually called a cult, that's called extreme, not balanced, and over the top. And all these words are good when, the, when they're accusations, because normally that's where the Lord is at. Thus teaches a leader of the Bible College at Eden's flagship church. Find yourself a church that's usually called a cult, that's called extreme, that isn't balanced and is over the top. Find yourself that church. Good advice. And having moved in that circle, I can honestly tell you that I've visited many of those types of churches in which he speaks. Word of faith, prosperity preaching, Pentecostal churches, Churches often referred to by others as cultic, extreme, not balanced, and over the top. 
I've visited many of them, they exist. And believe it or not, they encourage their adherents to be proud of such accusations. And they teach them that it's just the kind of place that Jesus would hang out. <laughs> well, coming on to what I think is happening now, I do agree with Robert Sleeman on one thing. We do agree on something at least. We live in a time when we should all be considering whether we can stay or whether we should leave the churches in which we find ourselves. You see, having endured just about every counterfeit move of the spirit going in Pentecostal church since the late 80s, I'm convinced now, at last, hallelujah, praise the Lord, that I'm witnessing the Holy Spirit moving powerfully at this time. It's just not in the manner that those wicked men told us it would be. It doesn't look like the kind of revival that they promised us. I sincerely believe that that which we are witnessing today, the shocking things that are taking place in our churches up and down the countries and in our nation, and not just in the Pentecostal churches, I truly believe, brothers and sisters, and you may not agree with me, but this has been committed by God. I believe that God is judging the church, for the time has come for judgment to begin in the house of God. And I believe he sent upon us, the church that is, a time of severe testing by which he will establish if there is anything left of any value to be found in the church. And that which he's looking for is faith. According to Barnes' Bible notes in 1 Peter 4, 17, 18, where it says the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God, judgment, the Greek word krima, seems to mean the severe trial which would determine character. It refers to such calamities as would settle the question whether there was any religion or would test the value of that which was professed and it was to begin in the house of God or to be applied to the church first in order that the nature and work of religion might be seen. There's a testing. There's a judgment on the church already. That's what we're witnessing. That's what we're living through. Would the Lord allow it? Of course he would. When you read the book of Job, as early as the 8th verse of the first chapter, you understand that God already knows everything there is to know about the character of Job. And then yet he allows Satan to test him. I always think of this, by the way, when uh, Jesus prayed for his disciples. See, in the church circles that I moved in, somebody came and said, Oh, Brother Ian, pray for me. Satan has asked if he might sift his weak. We would have said, but we've laid hands on, we've pleaded the blood, and we've rebuked the devil. That's what he did. But that's not what Jesus did. But I have prayed for you that your faith will remain firm. Hallelujah. And afterwards, return to me and strengthen the brethren. Would he permit such a time of testing? Yes, he would. We've been established, and it's now being established in the church, whether there is any faith left in the church. And it's taking some severe sifting, it's taking some severe trial, it's taking some severe testing to establish whether there is any true faith left in the church. Bless God, people like you, and by His grace me, are leaving. But again, there's another conversation I had over coffee. Doesn't it doesn't amaze you? How, how those that we, we know and love can find themselves and see all the same things going on in church that we've been talking about and yet seem unmoved, yeah. not bothered, not ashamed, as we heard last night, they don't even blush anymore. Separation taking place. I'm truly of the opinion that the church is being tested. But the individual believers, you and I, are being tested. And the question is this, will you be complicit with the things your church and your denomination does, or will you distance yourself from it? This was the stark choice that I was confronted with. Maintain my association with Eden, hope that they would meet my every need, provide me with a church, a mount, a stipend, or having waited so long to fulfill my call and come into ministry, hand back my credential and leave. Bless God by His grace. I find the courage to do the latter. Yeah. Amen.
everything in my flesh. I didn't give you my personal testimony about how, you know, what happened to our businesses. And I'd love to tell you I gave up everything for the gospel, but I gave it up willingly in order to become a full-time minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I needed a lot of help from God, and he took those things away from me. And in my wilderness years, what I had was my credential. That was, that was me. It was, it was my purpose, my meaning. It meant everything to me. And I was hoping and expecting to do well within the Elin movement. And I was looking for a stipend and a manse uh, and a church. It seemed to be, to be my way out. But of course, Elin is not my sufficiency. And never has been. So thankfully, I came to my senses. Unlike dear Chris, who said that he, he wept with his bishop and so on, I couldn't wait to get that back. I was well rid. Having come to the crossroads by the grace of God, I trust I made the right position. And in similar manner to myself, as others leave many churches of every mainline denomination, I sincerely believe that that which we sometimes refer to as the remnant church is being manifest before our eyes. Thank God it is. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard against them. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Little independent fellowships like Evangel Church in Sydney. Fellowships without the backing or the large machinery of, of, of denominationism. They are beginning to spring up already in houses and rented buildings as a refuge for <coughs> disaffected, spirit-filled believers who prize following Jesus above following their prejudices towards one particular denomination or stream of faith or another. People who are hungry for God's word in a famine-stricken nation where there's a famine, as it says in Amos 8, 11, not of bread nor of thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. <coughs> what a terrible judgment that is. I've got two minutes. Just let me show you something. I, I, I have It just feels right for me to share. Will you turn to Ezekiel with me, please? Just to broaden that by point a little, I don't have much more time, and I shall speak to you again. I'm looking forward to being ministered to during the conference, so this is just my moment to share something with you. Ezekiel 14, um, I'm going to come back to uh, 12, but to begin with, let me start in verse 21. Now before you shoot me down, I know that he's talking about Israel here, but we'll see something, and, and, and by the way, you know, God has a modus operandi, the way he does things, and with him there's no uh, variation of shadow of turning, he's, he is the Lord God, he changes it not. If he deals with Israel this way, he'll deal with us this way. But when we talk about judgments, let me make it perfectly clear. Well, the word of God, if that makes it perfectly clear for us, that God has four severe judgments. Okay? And, and again, it's useful to understand with all the prophecies that go around about judgments and so on. Let's see what God himself says about these four severe judgments. Verse 21. Well, thus says the Lord God, how much more it shall be when I send my four severe judgments on Jerusalem. The sword, and famine, and wild beasts, and pestilence. Therefore, brothers and sisters, according to the word of God, we can all now name the four severe judgments of God. Sword, famine, wild beasts, and pestilence. Now let me return you, if I may, to verse 12. I think it is going from memory. And we're going to see which one of these severe judgments Sword, famine, wild beasts, pestilence is the time of judgment we're in presently. Verse 12, the word of the Lord came again to me saying, Son of man, when a man sins against thee, hand by persistent unfaithfulness, I will stretch out my hand against it, I will cut off its supply of bread, send famine on it, and cut off man and beast from it. So now we've established that the Lord has four severe judgments. And the judgment that he reserves for a land, it says a land, not the land, or a land, in severe uh, uh, unfaithfulness, or maybe pardon, in persistent unfaithfulness, the judgment reserved when a land is in persistent unfaithfulness is a severe famine. And Amos 8 11 tells us it's not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but it's a famine of the words of the Lord. And that's what's happening. 
Now, I told you that I've been a missionary, I've been uh, preaching and teaching for many years now in Africa. I've seen famines and drought. I've seen and eat, I've eat, seen human beings eating straw and bark off trees, drinking infected water that they knew it would do them harm, but it's all that they could get hold of. That's what's happening in the nation today. That's, that's a, a picture of what's happening, of some of the nonsense, some of the filthy water people are drinking in the church today because it's all that they can get hold of. There's a famine. Have you ever stopped to consider just how terrible this judgment is when he says there will be a famine in the hearing of the words of the Lord? Because, brothers and sisters, does not faith come by hearing, and hearing by the word of God? Amen. And is it not by faith that the righteous are justified? Hallelujah. So, if there's no word of God, there's no faith. And if there's no faith, then we're not justified. And if we're not justified, we're not in right position with God, and we have an apostate church. That's what's happening. There is a judgment on the house of God right now. You see, it's something else that the other speakers have been talking about. It would be very easy for us to break into tears, but I say, bless God. What an exciting time to be alive, to see the Holy Spirit moving in this way, to see the end time church, the remnant church, becoming manifest in the age in which we live. And rejoice that you are here. Hallelujah. I pray that the Spirit will call out many, many more. Because there are little fellowships, pockets of true believers springing up all over the place. Refugees establishing such fellowships. These places, by the way, they're like arcs. Arcs to which God's people may escape and find refuge. And I believe that God is calling his people out of the mainstream denominations. And I think it's worth mentioning again, I know many of you will know it, this is something of which A.W. Tozer prophesied just over 50 years ago. Do you know that prophecy? Let me read an extract from you. Prophecy of A.W. Tozer. As the church now stands, 50 years ago, as the church now stands, the man who sees this condition of worldly evangelicalism is written off as somewhat fanatical. That's me. You. Us. But the day is coming when the house will be left desolate and there will not be a man of God among them. Now at this point, if I was giving the prophecy, I think I would say, oh, what a terrible day. Tozer said this, I would like to live long enough to watch this develop <laughs> and see how things turn out. I'd like to live to see the time when the men and women of God, holy, separated, and spiritually enlightened, walk out of the evangelical church and form a group of their own. Amen. When they get off the sinking ship and let it go down into the brackish and worldliness and form a new ark to ride out the storm. That's what we're doing, brothers and sisters. Why I left and why I came. Why you left and why you came. We got off the sinking ship, but it go down into the brackish of worldliness. You and I will form a new ark uh, into which we can ride out the storm of this judgment. Amen. And the doors are open and all are welcome. Pray God it will send many more. I need many more out of the apostate church as the remnant becomes manifest. Thus is the Spirit moving. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. It's just not like they promised me as a Pentecostal to be. It doesn't come with shaking and quaking and uncontrollable laughter, but an enlightenment and a leaning from the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Oh, Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> There will come a day when the words of Revelation chapter 18, 4 and 5, we heard it last night, will confirm this once and for all. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. For her sins have reached their heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. 
Amen. Praise God. If I come in a more reasonable fashion, Brother Chris said earlier, if you have left the sinking ship, give thanks and praise to God. Yes. And if you haven't, come out! Yes. Yeah. When I started in ministry, I was taught you should never encourage anybody to leave a church. Well, I still have the opinion it's the Holy Spirit who will lead you out, by the way. That's right. Only the Holy Spirit will do that. That's why there are still some empty chairs. That's why there's still room. The Holy Spirit is still working on people. But like the last speaker, and I believe it's a consistent theme that we're hearing, the time has come for those of us who have been enlightened by the Spirit, those of us who can see what's going on, those who have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches, it's time to call people out of the apostate church. And the Holy Spirit is doing just that. It's a wonderful time. The Spirit is moving. Yeah. God has everything under control. Yeah. He is sovereign. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Our small fellowship is made up of sincere believers. Don't ask me how, but they escape from just about every mainstream denomination that there is. And each of them has a story to tell. Why they can stay there no longer. As a Pentecostal, when I have people who have come from brethren backgrounds, suspicious about the gifts of the Spirit, I have people who come from the Church of England, we have people from, well, just about every mainstream denomination. And I don't know how he does it, brothers and sisters, I really don't. And it's nothing to do with me, but God binds us together yeah. in love. Yes. Amen. Irrespective of our church backgrounds. And to tell you the truth, I have two minutes, and so it's just as well I've got nothing left to say. <laughs> because to tell you the truth, I have no answer how to run a church service to suit everyone. Even if I wanted to be seeker friendly, which I'm not, or which I don't, I don't even try. We simply aim to continue steadfastly in the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. We attach a high importance on the teaching of the Word, and as an ashamed Pentecostal, we endeavour constantly to ensure that we have the Word and the Spirit in right balance, that we're Berean. Examine the Scriptures daily, my advice to you as it is to my own fellowship. Examine the Scriptures daily. He calls good counsel. Do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. Abstain from every form of evil. God bless you. I thought that he was good. <laughs> I love listening to people who agree with me. <laughs> Isn't that arrogant? <laughs> the Holy Spirit has many, many mouths. Yeah, yeah. One voice. All over the place I'm seeing faithful men and women of God. Perhaps in different languages, certainly in different locations, but the same, the same thing. For saying the exact same thing in terms of fundamental substance of what he had just shared. Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to have a lunch break now, and afterwards, we're going to introduce you to the world's only kosher altar boy. <laughs> well, tell me back now, Two fifteen. Two fifteen, please. Enjoy your lunch.